Everyone on earth knows about God, but not everyone knows God. Which one are you? We're going to look at Psalm 84 today that will give you a very clear definition of what it means to know God. Stay with me. I'll be right back. Finding and knowing God is a faith walk. The Bible says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Our hope lies in the coming Messiah, who will establish God's peaceful kingdom on earth. This is Faith Walk with Ron Susak. Dr. Ron is an evangelist committed to encourage and equip your faith walk as we pass through these turbulent end-time days awaiting that soon-coming kingdom. Here again is Ron Susak. Some years ago, a very good movie was made called the Man from Snowy River. I, I've watched it several times. I'm impressed with it. But one of the parts of the movie is this. There are two brothers that are in love with the same young lady, and the one marries her. Now, fast forward many, many years, and the man who married her has fathered a child, and that child is now a young lady. Long story short, he is filled with anger and jealousy because he thinks that his brother, who was in love with his, the same woman years earlier, fathered that child. At one point in the movie, he asked his brother, the man who was married, asked his brother, Is that really my daughter? And his brother said these penetrating words. If, if you knew her, you would not ask that question. Of course, she's your daughter. Did you get that implication? You didn't really know your wife. That you would think that she would be a woman of infidelity. She was totally loyal to you. There's a big difference between knowing about someone and knowing that person. There's a huge difference between being a theologian, knowing all kinds of thoughts about God, and knowing God. Do you know God? Psalm 84 is going to help you determine how well you know Him. Not how much you know about Him, how well you know Him. Verse 1, look at this. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. The author begins by revealing where he is in his walk with God, and he's saying that there's a dwelling place with you that I enjoy, and it is lovely. Nothing can match it. What is this dwelling place? John chapter 1, verse 14 reads this way. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, the word meaning Jesus Christ, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Think about this. Religious rulers knew about him, but they didn't know him. Why do I say they knew about him? They, they had been studying for centuries the, the truths of the Word of God about a coming Savior, Redeemer, Messiah. They had all the signs given to them that they needed to see, but they were blind to that, and they did not believe that Jesus Christ was their Savior and Messiah. They knew about Him, but they did not know Him. Simple people like Peter were the ones who were saying, My Lord and my God! I get who you are. I see it. I know who you are. Are you saying in your spirit, oh, my Lord and my God? Or are you still standing around saying, I'll believe it when I see it? Well, why haven't you seen it? Well, if you haven't seen it, it's because for some reason the Spirit of God has not been free to break through your unbelief to give you the revelation, Jesus is the Son of God. John, John 14, verse 23 reads this way, Jesus answered him, If 
anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, now get these words, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Did you get that? Where does God dwell? He dwells with those who are dwelling in him. We'll make our home with you, no matter where you are, no matter where you're going, no matter what you're doing. We will be with you. We will tabernacle. We will be with you, dwelling in you and surrounding you and with you. Verse 2, look at this. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. That is a man who has a heart after God's own heart. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Let me ask you a question. Is there a longing in you for God deeper than the longing for anything in this world? Success, fame, accomplishment, anything is the primal, the number one thing that drives you to know God? Oh, my friend, if not, you don't understand why you were created. You were created by Him and for Him, and knowing God is everything. To whom have you trusted your heart? The arm of flesh will fail you. Mates will fail you. Friends will fail you. This world will betray you. But there's a God who you can trust wholeheartedly with your heart and know that he'll never do harm to you. He'll chasten you. He'll hurt you to get you to obey him and learn of him and love him. But he'll never harm you. Hurt and harm are two different things. Hurt means you experience some pain. Harm means you're disfigured. He'll never disfigure you. That being said, I want, I want to take you to a text where David is on his deathbed talking to his son Solomon. And here's what he said to Solomon, his son. And you, Solomon, my son, know the God of your father. Not know about him. Know him. Know the God of your father and serve him with a whole heart and with a willing mind for the Lord searches all hearts and understands every plan and thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. My son, before I draw my final breath, I want you to know, seek God with all your heart. Day by day by day, it's not something you do once in life and say a prayer at an altar and then go and live your life the way you want. It's a day by day seeking God and submitting to Him and knowing Him better and better and better. My son, do this. That's the great legacy I pass on to you. Thank you for your gift to help Dr. Ron in building lives by advancing the teaching of God's Word through the programs of Faith Walk. You may never know until heaven whose lives you've impacted somewhere around the world. So please accept and enjoy your copy of God Will Answer as our personal thank you for standing with us at Faith Walk. You'll be encouraged and inspired as you open your gift book, God Will Answer by Dr. Ron Susak. Each week throughout the year, within the pages of this rich 52-chapter hardcover edition, you'll discover compelling spiritual truth and biblical insights, content that will enrich your life and challenge your heart to go deeper in your faith walk with God. And then in verse 3, we read these words. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself. Pause there. What is this saying? Even the sparrow and the swallow, they have built places of security. For what? Where she may have her young. Let me read that again. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may have her young, a place of safety for herself and her hatchlings. You want to have a place of safety for your husband, your wife, your children? 
Get alone with God every day in a special private meeting with God. Learning His ways, obeying His ways, loving Him, and all your home and your family will be surrounded by the heavenly host of warring angels who have never lost a battle in their lives. Let me read this verse now in completion. Even the sparrow has found a home and a swallow a nest for herself where she may have her young, a place near your altar. That's where I want to be, David, this, this psalmist is saying, a place near your altar, Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Are you designing a place near the altar of God? Yes, he's dwelling in you and with you and surrounding you. Are you just taking that for granted and going on with life? Or are you stopping dead in your tracks day and night to spend time dwelling with God who is dwelling with you? Let me illustrate it. If you have placed a wedding ring on your wife and a very expensive engagement ring, a beautiful diamond, if you bought her a gorgeous home and a beautiful car and a swimming pool and all kinds of wonderful things. But you don't spend time with her. You don't know your wife. You're in deep trouble and you don't know it. You're barren. You've lost everything without knowing you've lost it. How much more, if that is true of your wife, will that be true of you and God? Verse 4. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15. Critical verse to know. Let me read it. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. Here's God speaking. I dwell in the high and holy place. I also dwell with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit. To revive the spirit of the lowly, to revive the heart of the contrite. Pause there. God, who lives in a high and holy place, dwells with those who are walking lowly in spirit with a contrite heart. Let me read another text for you. Psalm chapter 138, verse 6 says it this way. For, th for though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty, the proud, the arrogant, he knows from afar. He'll have nothing to do with them. He will crush every proud person, every proud nation. Oh, I weary of the levels of pride we have. Pride in our bodies. Who has the best muscles? Pride in our beauty. Who has the best shape of a face? Pride in our wealth. Pride in our achievements. Pride, pride, pride. My friend, you want to know God? You better repent of pride and come to him with the, a lowly, contrite heart. Now, that doesn't mean you're wallowing in self-desecration or something. My friend, that means you know that you were created. You're not the creator. And you come humbly before God. His own son came humbly before him, riding a donkey into Jerusalem. My friend, don't get off your donkey, is what the scripture is trying to say. Walk humbly before God. He will raise you up in due time if he can trust you to walk humbly. There is no throne so high that he will not give it to you if he can trust you to handle that scepter of authority with humility. Is this making sense to you? Is this connecting? Verse 5, we read this. Blessed are those whose strength is in you whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. What is that saying? Blessed are those who really make God the very strength of their being because they know they're not here to stay. Oh, my friend, I, I hope you've lived long enough to know that you're going to be in the grave someday, maybe sooner than you know. And here you spent your energy, your time, your brain power, 
to somehow build a little empire here on earth as though you're here to stay. You're not. Oh, but Ron, I want to pass it on to my children. Well, the sad thing is, somewhere down the line, either your children or grandchildren or great-grandchildren, everything you tried to build is going to be dissipated. But that's the pattern of history. It's not going to be any different in yours. So the question is, what are you building in this lifetime today between you and God? Here's what Jesus said in Isaiah chapter 49, verse 5. My God has become my strength. Everything around me appears futile, Jesus was saying in that text in Isaiah 49. And he was seeing the crowds. He was not born yet onto this earth, but foreseeing what was going to take place, saw the crowds dissipating because they were there to get healed and get food, but not necessarily to follow him in heart and mind and soul. He saw disciples betray him, deny him, not understand him. He saw Mary and Martha rebuke him when he didn't show up at Lazarus' funeral in time. And he said, I have spent my strength for nothing. But he reversed it all when he said, My God is my strength. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 27 to 29. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. What is that saying? Oh, don't miss this one. God has told us in advance the heavens and the earth are going to be shaken. There are evil powers, principalities and powers and demons and wicked spirits in the heavenly realms, and they invade and attack on earth individuals and families and nations, even, even theology students, the Bible tells us. They're going to be teaching doctrines of demons because they didn't learn how to ward off these evil forces. Listen carefully. The heavens and the earth are going to be shaken. They're going to be brought to nothing. Only those who are dwelling with God and God dwelling with them who are in that nest of security, surrounded by the heavenly host as they go through this life, Assured that Jesus will keep his word when he said, Lo, I am with you all the way to the end of the age. If you will be teaching my gospel to the nations of the world, I'm with you. My father's name is Emmanuel. He is with you. You will walk in that security, that serenity. If you are dwelling with me and you know me. Verse 6. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools or blessings. What does that mean? The Bible speaks of many valleys. The valley of Baca. That was a place people had to go through on their way to Jerusalem. And it was a rugged place. There was the valley of Baca. There was the valley of the shadow of death and the valley of dry bones. Those who dwell with God refresh this barren world as they pass through. Well, let me say it again. Get this in your spirit and in your thinking. Those who dwell with God refresh this barren world as they pass through. What a glorious thought! In the early church, many times the pagan world around them didn't understand why these Christians would be singing and rejoicing as they were taking a loved one to their burial. Why would you sing and rejoice? Because we know we're just passing through. This world is not our home. We're going on to the great kingdom of God, and that loved one who passed away is now in the presence of Jesus Christ. We rejoice! Oh, yes, there's a bit of human sorrow that there's a little time gap before we see them, but we rejoice in where they are. The rest of the world doesn't have that hope. 
They mourn and grieve. Verse 7. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Think about that. Divine support brings hope and purpose, and it flows from the presence of God. Well, let me, well, let me say it again. Divine support, hope, and purpose flow from the presence of God. If you are dwelling with God, spending time with God day and night, no, you're not a radical. You're just someone who came to your senses. So don't let this world cheapen it and talk you out of it. If you're spending that time with God, the divine support that you will receive will, will bring, bring a support to you and to people around you. Divine support, hope, and purpose flow from the presence of God. Why does it say they go from strength to strength? Because when you go through a difficult time, a challenge, a closed sea in front of you, or a giant like Goliath in front of you, and you see God overcome that giant or open that sea and make the way for you, your faith increases and your strength increases because your faith is leaning more and more in total dependence upon God and God alone. Are you getting the picture? Oh, that's why this time with God is so important. And then the psalmist has a closing prayer. And in verses 8 and 9, we read this prayer. Hear my prayer, Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, God of Jacob. Look on our shield. In other words, look at who protects us. You yourself, you're our sovereign. You are our shield. O oh God, look with favor on your anointed one. That's my prayer. And my friend, <laughs> he will look on favor. He will look on favor. He is the giver of good and perfect gifts to those who love him. And then there's a closing benediction in verse 10. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. What a declaration. It is far better to be in your courts, in that inner sanctuary, in that nest of security, in that quiet time during the day and at night with you, my God. It is better to do that than be out frolicking with all the connivers and deceivers and immoral and people who love the filthy jokes and love the porn and love the booze and, and think that satisfying their body is all that matters in this life and Oh, my friend, are you getting the picture? How glorious it is to learn to make that sacred time with God every day and every evening the highest moments of your life. For the Lord is a sun, a shield. As a sun, he shows the way. As a shield, he protects you. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. Did you get that? The Bible tells us that God gives good and perfect gifts. If you're lacking good and perfect gifts, I will tell you that it's because God cannot entrust you with these glorious things because you'll self-destruct. You'll use them on your flesh, on your lust and greed and dissipate them. How many winners of the lottery have dissipated their lives? My friend, God loves to give good and perfect gifts. And I'm here to tell you that I can testify to that. I am surrounded by some of the greatest friends you could ever imagine. People who sacrificially help me. And they honestly, over time, it's been time tested and proven, they are not looking for anything in return. They just feel called of God to stand with me and help me. What an inevitable thing. I have a wife that has stood with me for many, many years, over five decades. And that relationship is stronger and more meaningful than ever as she is giving herself to stand with me and help me talk to you. 
Ah, oh, my friend, I am here standing on a mountaintop right now, talking to people around the world through this television and podcast media. I don't know how many hundreds, thousands, millions I'm talking to today. I'm only told by the people in media that there's not a place on earth where you cannot be watching this program. So whoever it is I'm talking to, I'm trying to affirm to you, if you come to know God, then God is going to meet all these things that we're we're talking about. So if you're saying, Ron, I, I know about God, but I'm not sure that I know God or whether you know him, I want you to say this prayer after me. Make this your personal prayer. Let's pray this together. Dear God, on the basis of that Jesus died for me, I'm trusting your forgiveness for all my sins. I'm asking you for the power to live committed to you, obedient to your will, from now until I meet you in heaven. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, my friend. Please be in touch and remember, Emmanuel, God is with you. Now, Dr. Ron has been talking to us about the end time days and wants us to prepare for the coming kingdom. And he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Write, for these words are true and faithful. The world is not ending. God is preparing a new world soon to begin. An ancient nation thought lost to extinction is soon to rise anew to prepare for that day. Isaiah identified this nation in a prophecy that has been hidden in plain sight for some 2,700 years. Its name is Assyria. My new book, The Assyrian Prophecy, reveals how Assyria will join with Israel and Egypt to bless the world under the soon coming Messiah. Amid today's chaos, God is searching for righteous people through whom he will bring the prophecy to completion. When you reach the end of this book, one question will be in your mind. Lord, what would you have me to do? You can learn more at theassyrianproject.org. This has been Faith Walk with best-selling author, pastor, and evangelist Ron Susek. We're certain you appreciate Dr. Ron's straightforward teaching of God's Word, along with his strong invitation to find salvation through Christ. But he needs your help in spreading the gospel to the far reaches of the world. So please accept and enjoy your copy of God Will Answer as our personal thank you for standing with us at Faith Walk. Join our team by going to faithwalk.org and clicking on Partner With Us. Well, thanks for being with us today. And we hope you'll join us again next week as we find courage for the journey in our faith walk.